All right. For just a few minutes this morning, I want to use some scripture, and, and it's going to be really short. Uh, it's, it's a question out of the book of Acts, the second chapter, 37th verse. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? Now, let me tell you that that is a question that uh, people were asking after the Apostle Peter had stood and preached that powerful sermon on the day of Pentecost. What, what shall we do? The Bible says they were pricked in their hearts and they wanted to know what they needed to do. Let me uh, just say to you this morning that as many times as I've said it, I want to say it again. There is no conversion without conviction. There is no one who converted anyone excepting the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about conversion of the soul. There is no other way than the way that is taught in the word of the Lord. And we need to understand that his way is a perfect way. It does not need anything added to it, nor does it need to have anything taken away from it. It's very difficult for us today to not want to change something about it. On one hand, there are people who will argue that it's too simple, it's too easy, and you people are trying to make it so simple that anybody can be saved. And on the other hand, you've got the group who says it's too hard and, and we should be able to do something to make it easier for people and, and it shouldn't be that complicated. God's plan of salvation is not complicated. It is not easy, but it is not that difficult either. What we need to understand this morning is that it takes God involved from the very beginning of the process all the way through to the completion. There is not going to be any conviction without the Holy Spirit of God. There is not going to be any conversion without the Holy Spirit of God. And we as God's people need to understand that it takes the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I, I couldn't help but think as Joyce was talking this morning that how well that fits in with what I wanted to say this morning. That we just simply must get to the point to where that we understand that we cannot do things by ourselves. You can't just make up your mind, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Now, I'm speaking now about those uh, of God's children who get this idea that, that they've got something that they're going to do or they want to do, and you're going to do it without the Lord. It will not, it will not be successful. It will not work. You may think that it has, but let me assure you that it takes the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God We've got a lot of people today that are preaching and teaching that, you know, all we've got to do is get you programmed. We've got to get you trained so you can do some of these things. Let me tell you something. The first lesson that needs to be taught is, is that for a child of God, we need to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I want to go back and set what, what brought about the, this multitude of people who were pricked in their hearts. They were pricked in their hearts by the Holy Spirit of God. And they were pricked in their hearts because the Holy Ghost had come upon them on the day of Pentecost. And I want you to look very carefully at the Word of the Lord because there are some today who are preaching that this is such a selective process that you've got to do certain things to be able to merit the Holy Spirit of God. If you go back and you read again when the Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost, it says it came upon all of them. A-L-L. -L. It was not just on the Apostle Peter. It was just not on the, uh, the disciples who were gathered there with him. Those other 11 men who were standing there with him. But the Bible says it came upon all of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. 
Let me assure you this morning that each one of us as a child of God need to be as filled with the Holy Spirit as we possibly can. That doesn't mean that we're always going to be just right up there at the peak. It doesn't always mean that our cup's going to run over. There are going to be some times whenever that we're going to get a little farther from the Lord than we should and we're not going to feel His presence as strongly as we should have the privilege of feeling Him. Even the Apostle Paul recognized that whenever he wrote to the young preacher Timothy and said unto him, You preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. There are going to be some times whenever, and I can tell you this from experience, that it's easy to follow the leadership of the Lord. There are times when it's easy to preach the gospel. There are times whenever it's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to stand and feel the great and powerful presence of the Lord. Then there are some times whenever that it's a struggle. There are some times whenever that you do it because you know that is what God called you to do. That is a time whenever that you have to probably dig a little deeper and try a little harder. But that does not excuse us from carrying out the work of the Lord. We just need to get a little closer to the Lord in those times so He can help us. And I'm speaking now again from experience. So please don't think for a minute that I don't know what I'm talking about because I've been in both of those situations. Listen, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came and filled a place where those people were gathered together and the Apostle Peter stood up there and with the great power of the Lord began to preach unto those people and he preached a powerful message unto them. What we need more of today is powerful preaching. We don't need any more of those who are just going to do it for pleasure. We don't need any of those who are going to do it to entertain you. That is not what the gospel is. It's not just entertainment. It is here for each one of us to be able to profit with and to be able to understand and to follow the leadership of the Lord. We need as God's children to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit as He speaks unto each one of us and He will. There were people who were gathered there and they were amazed at what they were hearing and what they were seeing. We pretty much lost that today. It isn't very often anymore that we get people very excited about the work of the Lord. We can get excited about, about everything else under the sun. There, you know, we're kidding a lot, kid a lot about here about fishing. Uh, I, I don't know whether I've ever preached on that or not here at the church, but I've got a sermon I can preach that one of these days uh, on fishing, uh, and 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 it's and it's all scriptural. It's not just something Parson made up, you know. But and now listen. Let me tell you something this morning. We can get excited about that. I get excited about it. Some of you say that would be the last exciting thing to me. But there are other things that we get excited about today. But not too often do I hear of a group of people who are really excited about what the, the, that God, through the Holy Spirit, is doing in the lives of people. And we need more of that today. We need, we need people who are excited about what the Lord. Now we just can't concoct this up. We can't just decide. Well, Ken got up this morning and we said we need to be more excited. Let me tell you something. If that's all the excitement you've got, you're in big trouble. Because all you've got is me. But let me tell you, the Spirit of God was working in those people and as the Apostle Peter got up there and began to speak, the people who were there were amazed at what they were hearing. It's my goodness. We're hearing every one of us speak in our own language, in our own tongue, the Bible says. But we understand what is being said. People of God, let me remind you, lost people do not understand what you are talking about when you begin to talk about conviction and conversion and this and that. It's alien to them. It should be alien to them. You're the one who's supposed to understand those things, but you're supposed to understand it enough to be able to help them because what they need in their heart and their life is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way they're going to get the Lord Jesus Christ in their heart is to hear the Spirit of God as He speaks to their heart. 
He'll do that in many different ways. He can do that through the preaching of the Word. He can do it through your being able to deliver His Word by being able to say to that individual, I love you. I love you. I care about your soul. I'm concerned about you. But you do that as the Spirit of God directs you because it takes the Holy Spirit to be able to do it. Peter, when he stood there and he preached that powerful sermon, he had preached many times before this. He had, he had enjoyed a, a tremendous amount of success. He was out there working with the other disciples as they spent the three plus years with the Lord. He had he's seen miracles performed. He had been able to see things happen that would have just surpassed the imaginations of man. But at a time like this, when he stood there and he preached this powerful message, he started out by talking about what was taking place right then. What's going on right now? I used to every once in a while when I would meet, and this was before I came back here, I still ask these guys this once in a while. I'd have a meeting with the deacons of the church, and I'd say, what's going on in our church? What's going on in our church? I wanted them to be sensitive as to what was going on. I wanted them to know what was going on. And they needed to be able to know so they could share with me. Because there are many times that people don't want to share with me. They don't want the preacher to know that, you know. Whether it's good or bad, it doesn't make any difference. But let me tell you something. The Apostle Peter started out here and he told those people what was going on. How that God had promised that he would send the Holy Spirit. And that was taking place right then and there in their midst. And then he began to talk about what those people had done. How they had taken this man by the name of Jesus Christ and they had crucified him. They had rejected him. They had denied him. And consequently they crucified him. Said away with him. I'm sure there were some people who were there who said, Oh, I didn't do that. That wasn't me. That's some of those other people. Let me tell you something. When the Holy Spirit of God begins to work in the heart of a lost individual, the first reaction is going to be, That's not me. I'm not doing that. You know, first of all, they're denying and rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not denying and rejecting me. And that's what brings about them being in that lost condition in, that they're in. They listen to the lie. Satan. Joyce mentioned earlier that, you know, there is another voice out there that's going to speak, and that is the voice of Satan. It is a powerful voice. It is a, it is a, very, it is a very cunning, deceiving voice that's going to speak to the hearts of those who are lost and to continue to get them to stay in his clutches as long as he can possibly keep them. He has them right now. He wants to keep them, and he'll do whatever's within his resources to be able to do that. And let me tell you this this morning, that he's never going to present himself to you as that red demon with the pitchfork in his hand. He's going to present himself to you in the most cunning, pleasant, deceiving way that he possibly can, in a way that you're going to like him. You're not going to be afraid of him. You're not going for a second. Oh, that's the devil. No. He's going to come to you in a way that he knows that he can convince you. Now, as a child of God, he still does that to us as God's children. But he knows he can't have us. All he can do is hope to get a little bit of our life to serve him while we're here or to not serve the Lord. You see, if he can keep us from serving the Lord, he's accomplishing his goal right then. And many times God's people are listening to him and saying, well, you know, I believe that's somebody else's responsibility. I don't believe the Lord wants me to do that. Let the preacher take care of it. That's what we pay him for. Sometimes God is going to speak to you as one of his children just as surely as I'm standing here and give you a portion of his work to do. He didn't save you just to escape hell. You're going to escape hell because you are saved, but he saved you to glorify him, to honor him, 
to be proud to be one of his children. And if there is any one thing that we need to say this morning when it comes to saying thank you, we need to say unto the Lord, Lord, thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for caring enough about me to redeem my soul, to lead me by your Holy Spirit to the foot of the cross and to redeem my soul. Oh, Peter began to preach unto these people about how they had taken and crucified the Lord. They had rejected him. They had denied him. And as he preached this powerful message, the Holy Spirit of God began to work in the hearts of those people who were there. People, let me tell you this morning that God has to work in the heart of the sinner that's lost. God has to let that individual know exactly where they stand in his sight. And he does that. He does that. He doesn't have to ask me about who, or when, or where. He works in his own way. And he knows the hearts of every single one of them. He knows what they're going to have to do to get all the way to the foot of the cross. It's going to take him giving them the faith to believe to the saving of their soul. Now that's what it's going to take. I can, I can stand, I can preach, I can encourage. Every once in a while when we're working in all the service, I look around and I almost get this feeling. People say, well, why don't you do something? Do something. What they're really wanting you to do is to save them. Get it over with. I wish I could. No, I don't really. I guess do that because Lord have mercy. I'd have it in a terrible mess. Well, first of all, probably right now, I'd just say, I'd just save everybody all at once and then we wouldn't have to do all this. But, but that wouldn't work either. But sometimes I don't have the ability to do any more than you have the ability to do anything. One thing that I know for certain is that I don't have the power to save anybody. I can plead with them, I can instruct them, I can encourage them, but it takes the Holy Spirit of God to lead them all the way to the foot of the cross that they can be saved. Now, every one of us had to get to the foot of the cross for God to save us. Yeah, people say, oh, you ever heard me say, oh, I was saved down there in the Wheatland, coming up out of the gymnasium, the high school down there, coming up out of the gymnasium, somebody else. Say, oh, I was saved so and so, I was saved this place, that place, wherever it was. But the truth of the matter is, every single one of us got to the foot of the cross. That's where we got saved. When we got to the foot of the cross and we could bow before the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledge that there was nothing in us that was worthy of salvation and ask Him to save our soul. Yeah takes the Holy Spirit of God. We can't do it by ourselves. We can't just make up our mind. Jesus in his words said, no man cometh to the Father except by me. Yeah, you can't, you can't go to the Father and be saved without the drawing of the Holy Spirit. As Peter preached this powerful message, these people, he said this, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ every single one of us are guilty of his death every single one of us yeah if I had been the only lost person that there had ever been that lived in this world God would have still sent his son and said you need to go down there because he cannot be saved without your sacrifice. He isn't capable. He doesn't have the ability. And there is nothing that's worthy for that sacrifice for his soul excepting you. And he came. Came for every single one of us. When these people had heard, that, heard this, they cried out and said, what shall we do? Now I want you to listen very carefully to what the word of the Lord says. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart 
and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What's the first thing he said? What was the first word? Repent. Repent. We don't want to hear that today. We don't want to have to repent. We don't want to have to say we're sorry. We just want to be able to say, oh, you know what? All you got to do is just come on down here, come down here, and, and we'll receive you. Let me tell you something. We, I, we could receive every person that walked upon the face of the earth here in this church. We could have the biggest membership of, that there ever is, and everyone end up in hell. Because receiving you into the church is not what's going to save you. Repent was the first thing the Apostle Peter said. Well, now let's see. Maybe he needs to have a little precedence here as to how he would come about saying that. Let's go back over to the first old boy who came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Had, his, uh, had a leathern girdle about his loins. Had, a, had, a, had a, a coat of camel's hair, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Oh, John the Baptist. What was his first word? Repent. Repent. Well, let's take the next one then. The first words of the Lord Jesus Christ, whenever that he came and he started preaching and teaching, his first word was repent. Now Peter comes along here and says to these people, what you need to do is to repent. People, we must understand that we must be sorry for our unbelief. We must be able to say, Lord, forgive me that I denied you, that I rejected you whenever that you spoke into my heart. I turned you away. I became an enemy of yours. I'm sorry. We don't want to have to say I'm sorry anymore. We have a society today that teaches our people to say, don't you admit that you're wrong? Don't say you're sorry. Come up with some classical explanation as to why you did what you did or you thought what you thought. But don't you tell them you're sorry because that implies that you might be wrong. Let me tell you something. You better be able to say to the Lord, I'm sorry, while you're down here upon the face of the earth or when you finally get up there before Him, you're going to hear Him say, depart from me, and then you're going to truly be sorry. Repent. And be baptized. But now let me just tell you something. He said, for the remission of your sins. If you read it that carefully, that's what it says. But notice you do not get baptized before you repent. God does everything in order. There's an orderliness to every single thing God does. Baptism isn't going to save a single person. And you don't get baptized to get saved. You get baptized because of being saved. Now somebody's going to say, well, I don't know whether that's right or not. Well, I can just take scripture after scripture after scripture and disprove your concept, if that's your concept, of baptism of regeneration. And you're going to have a little trouble in being able to convince anybody that it does take, that baptism washes away your sins. First of all, the first thing you're going to run into is, is that you're going to have to describe to me how then that you're going to get Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob into heaven. I'm going to go back over the Old Testament. Let's take They're going to be there. That's proved in the New Testament. Especially whenever you begin to talk about some of those old patriarchs. How about Moses? Yeah. I'm not going to get off in an argument with you here this morning. Yeah. You know, what, there's an old saying when you're arguing with a fool, there are two fools arguing. So <laughs> I'm not calling you a fool. 
But it doesn't teach baptismal regeneration. It says repent first and then be baptized. We Baptists are scared to death to preach baptism, so. Yeah. I don't know why. Well, I do know why. Because we're afraid someone's going to get the idea that we're preaching baptismal regeneration. We're not. But every child of God that's ever been saved needs to be baptized. That's the next step after the Lord saves the individual is to place your light on the candlestick that it may give light to all those that are in the household. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. You can't do that if you put it under the bushel. Y'all learned that little song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Yeah. Yeah, we ought to practice it. But before you put your light on the candlestick, you got to have a light. And the only way that you can have the light is to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, and allow Him to redeem your soul. Repent, Peter said. And be baptized for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Now that's not a separate dispensation. It's not something that you've got to work for, or that you've got to be good for, or that you're not entitled to until you've met all the criteria that some of our people have the idea today that you have to make. Whenever the Lord Jesus Christ comes into your heart, I'll guarantee you, you'll have received the Holy Ghost. It's not another work of grace. It is the original. Every single one of you who've been saved received that portion. We sometimes just get everything so messed up. You cannot be saved until you've been convicted. You've got to know, first of all, that you're lost. And you're going to have to know that not because I tell you, but because God Almighty tells you, leads you by the Holy Spirit, directs your footsteps to the foot of the cross, and redeems your soul. With the heart, the Bible says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But you notice he's got them in order again. There's nothing out of order in about the work of the Lord. God does everything in order, and He does everything decently. He does not contradict Himself, and He doesn't run ahead of Himself like we do a lot of times. And some things in His Word are pretty difficult for us to accept. Remember, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to close. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch when he came down there? to the water with Philip. And he said, what hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, just one thing. Same thing that should hinder every person to die. You have to believe with all your heart, your mind, your strength, your soul. Yeah. Got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe. And when you've done that, when you believe with all of those things, I'll guarantee you there's no way in the world and there aren't enough devils in hell to stop you from being saved. But you're going to have to get there. And the only way you can get there is through the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. He's a perfect leader. He'll never mislead you. He'll never deceive you. He'll never lie to you. He's the one that you need in your heart and your life.